so what that does, these little changes, is to confer exquisite species specificities to each of these languages. So these molecules really do fit like locks and keys. That is how I think of it. Like when you have your key to your door, it looks like every other key, but only one of them really works, right? So these really fit like locks and keys with the receptors and allow species specific communication. So what I mean by that is if I take this molecule from Serratia and put it on Vibrio fischeri, nothing happens. And likewise, the Vibrio fischeri molecule has no influence on Serratia. So these are private, secret conversations that bacteria carry out with their siblings. This is how I count my brothers and sisters. And that is encoded in these little differences in these molecules and then partner differences in the receptors. So these molecules are for intra-species communication. These are species-specific languages. So when we got that far in our studies, we started to think that bacteria were having these social lives, right? They were talking with these molecules. The question was, what are they doing? I mean, obviously, all these bacteria that we see on Earth are not turning on bioluminescence. That's you know, this anomaly of the ocean. So we started to not only look at what the molecules were, we started to ask what are the kinds of behaviors that are controlled by quorum sensing in different bacteria. And so I just put a couple here. So I've told you how it works for bioluminescence, right? It only makes sense in that squid if all the bacteria make the photons of light together. Otherwise, there's not light that helps the squid. So a couple others that you might have heard of, I put on the slide. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that's just a uh, common bacteria that lives in the soil. You and I encounter it every single day. It doesn't matter to us unless you have cystic fibrosis. So this is an opportunistic pathogen that takes advantage of people who are um, compromised. And so people who have cystic fibrosis, you probably know that's a genetic muta mutation that people have that make it so they can't clear their lungs. So our lungs are sterile. We breathe in all kinds of gunk every single day, and we have all these mechanisms to keep our lungs sterile. People who have CF, this disease, can't do that. And so their lungs are always infected with a mixed culture of all kinds of different bacteria. What happens, and this is for reasons that we don't understand yet, is typically when a kid is in his or her teens, for reasons that we don't understand, they become permanently colonized with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and that's what kills people that have CF. And the reason is, is because Pseudomonas aeruginosa has a quorum sensing system in which hundreds of genes that are important for virulence are controlled by quorum sensing. So the bacterium gets in, it adheres to the person's lung tissue, it makes what's called a biofilm, which is just a film on the lung tissue. It covers itself in a, in a um, polysaccharide, a sugar sheet that makes it impervious to antibiotics. And then it starts secreting all kinds of exoproducts, toxins and virulence factors that chew up the person's lung tissue. The bacterium is simply trying to get nutrients to grow and make more of itself. The problem with that is that it damages the person's lung tissue during that process. All of these genes, the biofilm genes, the toxins genes, the virulence genes, all of these genes are controlled by quorum sensing. And so if you think about the, and this is why this pathogen is so effective, but if you think about it from the side of the bacterium instead of the side of the human, it's a fabulous strategy. Your immune system evolved to see bacteria. What your immune system does is to do surveillance in your body and to find invading bacteria and get rid of them. That's what your immune system does for a living. All of these virulence factors are enormous red flags for the immune system. So the better idea from the pathogen's point of view is for it to get in to wait to count itself with these small molecules, to recognize when there's a, the, enough of the bacteria that if all of them launch this attack together, they're gonna be able to overcome a huge host. So now what we know is that all the clinically relevant pathogens that you have heard of, all of them have quorum sensing and they always control biofilms and virulence factor expression with these chemical communication circuits. And it makes sense from the bacterial point of view because it makes them effective at being able to stay in a host that doesn't want them. So that's one. That's, I just put this other one. This is called Erwinia up there because this one you've definitely seen. This is the one that makes your lettuce turn brown in the fridge, that makes your, the lettuce leaves gudgy. You guys have all seen that one, right? So just so you have one you know, that you've encountered. And so the idea is exactly the same. In this case, Erwinia is a plant pathogen. So it wants to make a wound in your lettuce leaf, right? So it's just like Pseudomonas. It waits, you know, because lettuce and 
plants have immune systems too. It waits, it counts itself, it recognizes it when it has the right number that it can make a wound in that potato or that plant, and you see the effects of that with that brown stuff. But the really insidious thing that this bacterium does is that simultaneous to releasing all of these virulence factors, it also releases a huge raft of antibiotics that kills all the other bacteria around, but it has immunity too. So what it does is it kills off all the competitors and keeps the wound, you know, the plant to itself and its brothers and sisters, right? And so this, so that's a very cool, well, you can see what I think about bacteria, right? I'm in love with these guys. But anyway, you can, so you can see like this list goes on and on, right? We have hundreds of examples of these, but all of the um, traits at a first approximation, the way we're starting to understand quorum sensing is that the traits that are controlled by quorum sensing are the kinds of traits where I'm going to give something away and I don't have a prayer that I'm ever going to get it back. I need you to participate in you. And then if, ever, if I get your, if all the neighbors work, then the, tra the behavior becomes effective, right? It's only with the collective action of the group that these behaviors can be successful, right? So you, so you get that. So that's what we're starting to think about what quorum sensing is. It's these kinds of um, behaviors that you need lots of cells working in synchrony and then the behavior is, is functional. So that's where we got to at the beginning of our studies, but we started to think, and we thought that that was, you know, you know, if I can say, neat, you know, that these bacteria have these primitive communication circuits that are very much like the circuits in our body. But then we started to think, after we got sort of this far in the molecular biology and the chemistry, we started to think about how bacteria really live in nature. And so this is a picture of your skin. This is taken from your elbow. And so all of your body looks like this. Doesn't matter where you take a sample. And so this is just um, under the microscope. And what I hope you can see, and I've already alluded to this, you're covered in bacteria, right? But each of these different shapes is a different species of bacteria, right? So there's, you have thousands and thousands of species of bacteria in and on you. And so when we started to think about how quorum sensing might work, we thought it's really good, you know, and, and it's interesting and useful for bacteria to be able to have these conversations with their siblings. But if they're really looking like the, really living like this in these incredibly mixed communities, it doesn't do you any good to only be able to count your siblings if somebody else is there. Then you're not really counting the total population, right? Because you need to know who's in the minority and who's in the majority of any given situation. So we started to think, well, maybe quorum sensing is more complicated than these simple intraspecies specific systems. And so to try to think about whether the chemical lexicon could be more diverse, we went back to these bioluminescent bacteria. And so what we decided to do was to look at a cousin of Vibrio fischeri. So you remember that the first bioluminescent bacterium I talked about, Vibrio fischeri, is a symbiont in that squid. It lives in a pure culture. There's no other species of bacteria in that light organ except Vibrio fischeri. But it has a relative named Vibrio harvii that lives free living in the ocean. So it's also a bioluminescent bacterium, but it doesn't get this free ride in the light organ of the squid. It lives in the ocean in a mixed species environment with all kinds of other species of bacteria. And so we wondered, well, wh how does that bioluminescent bacterium communicate? And so why I um, want to tell you the story and why I put this picture here is because I want to try to, I thought you might be curious like what we actually do in my lab. And so what you're looking at and why we worked on these bi bioluminescent bacteria initially. So what you're looking at, this is a flask. This is just a person from my lab. So this is hand holding the flask. And this is a liquid high cell density culture of Vibrio harvii, this free living marine bioluminescent bacteria. So there's all these molecules there. The bacteria are in dense suspension. They turn on light. And so to take this picture, all I had to do was turn the lights off in the room. This is what we see. I'm not doing anything to the cells. They simply make this beautiful light that you can see with your eyes. Thank you.